If you were in a bookshop browsing and you saw on the shelf a book entitled How to Be Happy, I wonder what you'd do. Some of you, I won't ask for a public vote, don't worry. Some of you would take it down and have a look at it. Others of you, perhaps a bit more cynically, might say, no way. I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole because that's just not possible. But it's true, isn't it, that there's a whole industry that's grown up around the idea of making us happy, making us content with our lives, actually helping us to feel positive about everything. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of books which aren't actually called How to Be Happy, but actually the title means that. How to Be Happy. Now, <clears throat> it's very interesting that the Bible doesn't actually talk that much, surprisingly, about Christians being happy. Now, that might shock you a bit, but I think it's true. Because actually, there's an enormous difference between being happy and the kind of joy which has been the subject of some of the things that Helen and others have done with us today. And we need to think about what that difference is. The word happy and happiness comes from the same root word as what happens. Okay, the, the verb to happen. And so, feeling happy with our lives, depends very largely on what happens. And what happens in the world around us, we know perfectly well, if we are honest, does not necessarily make us happy. In fact, it might well do the opposite. It might well have the effect of making us feel pretty depressed. And the difference between those two things is demonstrated wonderfully well by the story that we have just listened to. If I can just illustrate and give you the background that you need. We're in the Roman city of Philippi. Philippi was an interesting city because it was mostly occupied by Romans who had been soldiers in the army and who, for one reason or another, either through injury or retirement, had left the army. And the emperor didn't want these people hanging around Rome because they were a potential source of trouble. And so he sent them off to a Roman colony to enjoy their retirement, the city of Philippi, which is in modern Greece. And so it was full of people who had a right, really, to live in Rome, but who the emperor didn't want there. So these were pretty savvy people. They'd been in the army. They knew what they wanted, and they wanted pretty much a quiet life. And so when two men called Paul and Silas turn up, I mean, to talk about something other than the Roman gods that they were used to, and saying there's another way to live, and interfering with the status quo by delivering this, this woman who, from her powers to, to tell the future. They, they, were, they, they, they were interfering with some very powerful vested interests. And so they're dragged off to the magistrates, and the magistrates allow the good citizens of Philippi, who have done this plenty of times when they were soldiers, to brutally beat them and sling them into jail. Now, you have to remember that you're also dealing here with a Roman jail. Please do not think armly. The idea that you treat prisoners with a degree of humanity is a 20th century idea. This is the first century AD in Rome. If you were thrown into prison, if there was no one to look out for you, to come in from outside and to meet your needs, you were left to rot. And you were guarded pretty well by these Roman jailers. You know, they didn't want any trouble in their Roman colony. 
And so this jailer was probably paid quite well to keep anybody troublesome well away from the town, the city, and everything that went on there. And so the story tells us that Paul and Silas, for doing what they did, were beaten by the local people. The magistrates allowed them to do it. They chucked them into a Roman prison where, as far as they were concerned, they were going to be left to rot. And if you were stuck in that position, having been severely beaten, how would you be feeling? I don't think you'd be feeling happy. And I don't think Paul and Silas were feeling very happy either. Because all the bad things that could possibly happen had happened to them. And now they had to decide what they were going to do. But the story tells us that they didn't just commiserate with each other and spend their time yelling out every obscenity possible at the Romans who had jailed them. It says that at midnight they were praying and singing hymns to God. Bizarre. Completely bizarre. Stupid. But it says the prisoners, the other prisoners, all these sort of good-for-nothings, were listening to them. Perhaps they didn't have any choice. You know, and what would you have felt like if these two nutcases are just singing hymns to God at midnight? You know, we, we read these stories and we, we forget that this was crazy. Now, how come Paul and Silas could do that when everything bad that could possibly happen had happened to them? Well, the answer is that this was not happiness in that sense. It couldn't have been. But they had something else inside them which allowed them to do that. They knew that what had happened to them did not deprive them of a relationship with God who had created them and who had given them a purpose for living that they never imagined possible. And that God, they believed, was the creator God who was still on the throne of heaven, who was still in charge of everything, no matter what had happened. And that God had come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, had died a brutal death on the cross himself, had come back to life, and had accepted them, bad as they were, as his followers. And there was something there, deep inside them, to be really joyful about, despite the fact that everything possible that was bad had happened to them. And they were singing to God, you know, we praise you, God, that we can know you in the midst of this hellhole. And that we still have that, that these Romans who think they've taken away our liberty have done no such thing. And even if they kill us, it would be wonderful to be with you in your kingdom. And they were praying things like that and singing hymns to the God who is their creator. And it says, people listen to them, these hardened prisoners. Now joy comes from somewhere outside of ourselves. We don't naturally find it in there. In fact, the New Testament says that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. It grows there because God's presence lives within us if we believe in him. That's the difference between happiness and joy. Paul and Silas could not be happy in any way, but yet joy, the joy of heaven, was theirs in the midst of that prison. And the story tells us, whether we believe the unlikeliness of this or not, But at midnight, there was a violent earthquake which was so bad that it shook the buildings around amongst them. Now, I don't know whether... You don't have earthquakes like that in this country very often. I don't know whether any of you have ever been in a really bad earthquake. It must... I've seen photos of such things. I used to live in New Zealand, so I was in one once. 
But, you know, I, I, the, the, the pictures I've seen suggest that the buildings just shake around you and that, you know, you've no control over, you know, the ground that's moving under your feet. This is scary stuff, folks. You know, this is, and this building starts falling around, around their ears. But yet, of course, what it does is that it sets them free. And if they wanted to, they could just wander off and say, this is fantastic, isn't it? But they don't do that. Of course, they hang around because they notice that the jailer thinks that he's going to lose his job and that the magistrates are going to kill him because all of these people have got away. And Paul and, you know, they're, but they're all listening to Paul and Silas, you see. And Paul and Silas say, don't go anywhere. You know, we don't want this guy to take his life. And the jailer, who's about to kill himself by putting, running a sword through himself, he's prevented from doing that. And instead, he comes up to Paul and Silas and says, actually, what must I do to get, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to get what you have got? Because I have seen you two guys. Everything that's bad has happened to you. You, have cl you are clapped in irons. You're in the jail. You have this earthquake happen so that the buildings are falling down around your ears. You're at grave risk of death in one way or another. And yet, you're still, there's something about you. You've got something that none of that's going to take away and which somehow controls your life. I want that. And I want it for me and I want it for my wife and I want it for my kids. You know, I've never seen you before, but I need what you have got because I ain't going to get that anywhere else. And so Paul says, well, it's very simple. You simply have to believe that what Jesus Christ tells us is true and that you're going to hand your life over to live that way. And he says, fine, we'll do that. The whole family. And... I don't know what that looked like, but a baptism service took place in the midst of all of this rubble and whatever, and a whole family has the kind of experience that we've just given to Matthew this morning. Incidentally, some Christians tell you that they don't believe in infant baptism because it's not in the Bible. It is. It's in this story. Okay? The whole family get baptised and they, they, the, the parents, in effect, promise to bring up their children in the way of Jesus Christ when they're old enough to receive it for themselves. And I'm sure they did, having lived through all of that. Now, when we look at it that way, we can see somehow the importance of what we've all participated in this morning. There is something in us, isn't there, that wants to be happy. And we feel that that's something worth pursuing for ourselves and our family. That's why these books sometimes do get us. Actually, we know that the world that we face out there, most of the time, is actually pretty depressing. There are good things in the news, aren't there? Like saving these lads in Thailand from that cave. Fantastic story wonderful outcome. But actually, if you were to uh, rate the items in the news on a scale of good to depressing, most of them would be pretty depressing, actually. And if we live by the things that happen, we're all going to be quite depressed at the end of it all. Because for many of us, life is tough. We can't just rely on the things that happen to feed in to our own well-being. And what many of us believe here is that by giving Jesus Christ that first place, we become possessed by something, or we live by something rather, which allows us to encounter joy, which is very different from happiness which allows us to get in touch with something, which allows us 
even if the circumstances around us are pretty depressing, to come to church and to worship God with a degree of joy in our lives. And all it requires is, as we've seen with with Matthew's family this morning, is to come to God with an admission that God's way, as set out in the New Testament and in the Bible, is actually the best way. If we live that way, we can somehow be possessed of the kind of joy that Paul and Silas had, which allows us, even if really bad things happen to us and to our health and to our happiness and whatever, to actually live with that. And you know and I know that we probably know people whose personal circumstances are really difficult and really depressing but yet who will tell you that they draw strength from their faith and from something which doesn't actually come from inside them, but which comes from God. And through bringing their children to baptism, David and Lucy are in effect saying, well, that's the best way to live. Because even if these terrible things which the world throws at us do happen from time to time, we still have something within ourselves to turn to which is going to sustain us through that. And we may never have to live through the kind of circumstances that Paul and Silas in the story had to live through, you know, of being beaten and thrown into jail, no one to look after us and whatever. But some bad things might well happen to us. You know, we might have to deal with chronic illness amongst our family, with a breakdown in our health. And I encounter plenty of people like that almost on a day-by-day basis in my work but they're not depressed. They don't feel that that's the end of everything because they're drawing on something outside of themselves which allows them to encounter a joy in God the Creator who made us, who came to earth for us in Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us and who can live within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. God made us to have joy. Yes, he did. And just perhaps, if we live with that inside us, we might find that from time to time, people start coming to us and saying, how on earth do you do it? How can it be that even though all this has happened to you, you still somehow seem to be able to come to church and to praise God? And, and, and in that moment, we have the ability to tell our story and to say, well, this is why, because I've come to know that that God lives inside me by the power of his spirit. And even if this difficult stuff happens, I'm going to trust him. Even though the world seems to be falling apart around us, I'm still going to trust him to lead me through all of that because ultimately there's safety in that and I'm still going to belong to him even if the ultimate worst thing happens. That's what faith is. And we're challenged to have that faith today, to embrace it. The baptism service challenges us to do that. And let us take hold of that faith, knowing that in the face of all the things that can happen to us, that will be a certain foundation for us, whether we live or whether we die. We're not depending on what happens to make us happy, but on the God who created heaven and earth and who loves us and wants us to live with him forever.